to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Corporate media claims democracy dies in darkness. We got that story plus two good news confrontations. But first, a bit of an obituary. The blind shake and the CIA as corporate media again bury U.S. support for radical Islamism. Two days ago, a couple days ago, the Takfiri Islamist leader Omar Abdul Rahman, the so-called blind sheikh, died in a U.S. prison. He'd been found guilty of involvement in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing and of other crimes. The obituaries, however, of Omar Abdul Rahman in U.S. media are an example of whitewashing of the U.S. exploitation of radical Islamism for its imperial purposes. This article coming from Moon of Alabama. While extensively documented in earlier media and official reports, the CIA's facilitation and involvement with Abdul Rahman is completely stricken from history. But let's go back. Go back to those yonder years of the old gray lady. In December 1990, the New York Times reported, quote, the 52-year-old religious leader, Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, entered the country more than five months ago despite being on a State Department list of people with ties to terrorist groups, the authorities said. He illegally obtained a tourist visa from a consul in the United States Embassy in Khartoum, the Sudan, in May, according to records of the Federal Immigration and Naturalization Service and State Department officials, end quote. A few years later, in July 1993, the New York Times reported that that illegally obtained tourist visa was not illegal at all, saying, quote, American officials had acknowledged last week that the diplomat at the United States Embassy in Khartoum who signed the May 1990 visa request that allowed... Mr. Abdel Rahman to enter the United States was in fact a CIA officer. Several attempts to remove Abdel Rahman from the U.S. mysteriously failed, and in 1991 he was inexplicably granted a green card despite still being blacklisted. James, this kind of goes back to, I think, probably a lot of us as the web was hitting everywhere and we all started to have a lot of questions. World Trade Center 93 was a part of the you know, part of the investigations as we were looking at 9-11, we were looking at JFK, and we were looking at the banks, and we were looking at all of that stuff. This is one of those kind of fundamental, fundamental stories that's playing out right now, just as everybody wants to talk about the deep state, deep state, deep state. Yeah, but for some reason, they don't want to talk about this aspect of the deep state. And yeah, as that article from Moon of Alabama notes, none of their obituaries, none of the things that have been written about the blind shake in the last couple of days notes this On the record, documented, New York Times approved, establishment approved history of the blind shake. He was let in on purpose by the CIA and protected in the United States, despite numerous attempts to get him out. And then he goes to ringlead the 1993 WTC uh, plot, which I'm sure people will know is up to its neck with FBI informants and uh, agents and I mean, it's just, this is the history of the War of Terror. It is 100% littered with CIA and FBI fingerprints all over everything. And I think this uh, article uses the phrase whitewashing of the U.S. exploitation of radicalism. I I guess this is brownwashing. It's trying to make all of this terror. Look, look at the scary Muslim boogeyman. Look over here. Look at the Muslim boogeyman. Do not look at what the CIA is doing. Do not look at what the intelligence agencies are doing to foster, fund, train, allow, equip, bring these terrorists into the country, protect them in the country, make sure that their plots go ahead. This is the exact reason why the entire war on terror narrative is a lie. And it's weird that this story, this uh, the blind shake died a couple days after I posted that J. Michael Springman interview where we talked about the blind shake and other terrorists that have been led into the United States on purpose by the intelligence agencies. So if you haven't seen that yet, please check into it. How the CIA lets in the terrorists. We were just talking about it. It's right here in the news. And for some reason, the news isn't going to feed it to you. And I just noticed right before we started recording this, James, that you earlier today retweeted someone with the old canard, the fear equals false evidence appearing real. I think that's a very good uh, summation of this story. And in fact, all of the stories we're going to be talking about today. I I think so. I think so. And, and, you know, this gigantic story, World Trade Center 93, where, again, even the guys involved thought, I thought thought you were going to swap it out and use a dummy bomb. You guys messed it up gigantic stories like that where they're bringing them into the country or even stories like here in Portland a couple years ago where they basically push and prod dumb street kids into doing a bomb at the at the Christmas tree thing 
And again, it's just story after story after story. Let's get maybe twice as much good news as we had last week, James. And of course, we always have to give this. It's not always not unmitigated good news. But I like I like the rest of the stories we're going to talk about on this episode of New World Next Week. And the first one of the two we grab from my buddy Mike in Philly, where it's a story about turning a traffic ticket into the constitutional trial of the century. Lawyer Adam McLeod got a traffic camera ticket, an affidavit signed by Montgomery Cowley, Alabama police officer. It averred that he had committed a particular traffic violation on a certain date at a certain time in a certain location. It showed a photograph of one of the McLeod family vehicles. It charged him with a civil violation of criminal law. He wasn't driving the car. In fact, at the time, he was in a faculty meeting at the law school where he teaches. Thus, he decided to challenge this injustice on the principle of the thing. Goes through all the long court story, but it gets down to the good part. On cross-examination of the police officer who signed the affidavit, Adam McLeod established that the cop was not present at the time of the alleged violation. The cop has no photographic evidence of the driver. There were no witnesses, and the cop doesn't know where Adam McLeod was at the time of the alleged violation. And then the question. So you signed an affidavit under the pains and penalties of perjury alleging probable cause to believe that Adam McLeod committed a violation of traffic laws without any evidence that was so? Without hesitating, the cop answered yes. It surprised both of them. It surprised the judge who woke up for the first time. A police officer had just testified under oath that he perjured himself in service to a city government and a mysterious faraway corporation whose officers probably earned many times his salary. The city then rested its case. Adam McLeod renewed the, the motion to dismiss, which the judge, of course, immediately granted. James, case closed. Yeah. Uh, what an excellent follow-up to our story last week, where we were mm -hmm. talking about the red light cameras, and we were talking about the traffic, uh, the license plate uh, tracking systems and all of that, and how they were being combated in the courtrooms and by the legislatures. Well, here's another example of this. And again, it goes, does go to the principle of the thing, the, the idea that in law, you can have police officers signing uh, traffic violation tickets for things that they did not witness, they have no proof of, that, that can demonstrably be proved to not be the person that they're giving the ticket to, and yet they can still do it. That, I mean, it's the, the fact, again, that so many people go through this, and this has happened to so many people, but you don't really think to fight it. You don't want to go through all the rigmarole, and it is a rigmarole. Go read it, the whole story. It's a big rigmarole about the whole court case that this guy had to go through, and it helps that he was a lawyer or a law professor, so he actually knows the system and can do all of that. Most people can't, and so it would be an insurmountable obstacle. But when you get down to the brass tacks, yep, this police officer admits, yes, I perjured myself. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> case dismissed. Get out of here. We don't want to see you again. This is craziness, and I, you know, hats off to people like this for not only standing up and doing this and going through the ring roll, but then putting it out there. Because again, once again, it's about our mentality and about the way we think about the world. And on that note, I'll direct people to my video from yesterday talking about traffic and traffic violations and how uh, our consciousness has so much to do with the way that we see the world. <laughs> I I I missed that. Is that just are we are we synchronistic here? Or? It is. It's completely synchronistic. You should watch that video. It's very very apropos. <laughs> well, we'll include that, of course, in the show notes as well. So I wish there were. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that play out in that courtroom. I don't know if there's video of that. Even more so, I'd, I'd like to see a video of the next story that we're going to talk about. Man wrongly convicted with bite mark evidence confronts bite mark analysts. Now, this comes actually, James, you, you tweeted this story. I would have missed it. From one of the good ones at the, at the Washington Post. Now, you know, I'm from East Coast. I used to read the Washington Post. I enjoyed getting it on the Sunday editions. Radley Balco is one of the good ones there, still at the Washington Post. James, have you seen their new slogan? Have you looked at their webpage in the last day or uh, so? Yeah, oh. uh, Democracy Dies in the Dark. Democracy Dies in Darkness. It's a very just stark, it, it looks like a angry conspiracy mean like blog website it doesn't doesn't look like a venerable you know mainstream stalwart of journalism so democracy dies in darkness so go again let's see how interested they are in the logan act when the heads of the paper sneak away to bilderberg which has got to be coming up soon so i looked it up 
It might be coming up in Chantilly, Virginia, June 1st through the 4th Bilderberg Conference, possibly. More on that at Bilderberg.org. But this story, Keith Harward, wrongly convicted of grisly rape and murder and spent over 33 years in prison. The main evidence against him, bite marks found on the victim. Over the course of two trials, six bite mark analysts said the, mark, the marks were a match to Harvard's teeth. He was cleared by DNA testing last year. This week, Keith Harvard showed up in a New Orleans convention at the annual American Academy of Forensic Sciences, where he crashed the panel on bite mark analysis. The Richmond Times Dispatch reports, and I do so wish there was video of that. He said, quote, I'm not here to make friends. He was sent behind bars for rape and murder, largely on the erroneous testimony of two forensic dentists known as forensic od uh, odontologists. At the conference workshop with a number of all the muckety mucks all sitting around and his voice obviously rising, this stuff is all crap. It's bogus. This bite mark stuff is bogus. Why even continue with it? It just doesn't make sense. 34 years thinking, wow, just what just happened? You're taking people's lives in your hands and guessing. Well, I say it is so, so it's got to be. There's no gods in here. Why do it? Money and ego. This is a warning. If I find out anybody's testifying in bite mark evidence cases, I will come to the courtroom. I will contact the media. I'll stand on the street corner in a Statue of Liberty outfit with a big sign saying, this is crap. You can understand the media would love to talk to me about something like this. And he promised to speak to every camera on hand wherever bite mark evidence is being used in a trial in any fashion whatsoever. James, I love this story. I know we're not really ones to go, yeah, you guys should do this and you guys should do that. But there's a lot of super smart, engaged people out there. I mean, hell, they invented our own peer-to-peer -peer video platform, bitshoot.com. Surely somebody could make up an alert system, some RSS thing, Google Alerts, about bite mark evidence trials being used across the country. Is that possible? I'm sure it could be, and I certainly hope that uh, this, this person will continue that uh, that crusade that uh, is a it's a holy crusade it's a it's a righteous one because absolutely this is not it's not just insanity it's 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 disgusting it is absolutely disgusting that people will go on the stand and testify about their you know scientific analysis that has shown this and that putting innocent people in jail for years or decades of their lives based on complete flimsy nonsense that is ultimately disprovable um and, of course, it's not just bite marks. I wrote an editorial for the International Forecaster last year. We'll put the link in the show notes. Four ways the, the crime lab can frame you. And I was talking about microscopic hair analysis, um, which is total bunk. Lie detectors, of course, total bunk. Uh, fingerprints uh, being subjective and unreliable. Uh, something you don't generally hear about when the, in criminal trials. And also, speaking of WTC 1993, I, th I threw in that uh, a urine analysis that uh, that <laughs> the urea fertilizer nitric acid um, uh, explosive that they came to the evidence of in WTC 19 1993. And actually, it, the 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 crime lab, the head of the crime lab at that time, Dr. Frederick Whitehurst, proved that they couldn't distinguish between urea nitrate and urine because he peed in a beaker and they couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> I mean, he was proving that this was all a bunch of bunk, um, but they went ahead with the prosecution anyway. It, it, it's, it's outrageous, but once again, false evidence appearing real, and uh, when it appears real in your court trial, when you're suddenly on trial and you've got some scientific-looking dude up there saying, yep, bite marks 100% reliable. I mean, it's just, it's, it's horrendous. And I hope that, uh, absolutely it's good to see, it's weird to see the Washington Post cover this, but weirdly enough, they were the ones also covering things, um, like the, uh, the, 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 the microscopic hair analysis. The, the Washington Post was the one that was on top of that story and the, the, the crime lab, um, whistleblower, Frederick Whitehurst got, coverage in the Washington Post. So for whatever reason, they've been all over this for many years, and it's good to see there are at least some people who with some shred of integrity left at that Bezos-owned CIA operative nonsense Bilderberg piece of crap journalistic nonsense that is the Washington Post these days. There there are some good ones still there. I, I'm fortunate to know and have talked to a couple of them, again, from, from, from living back in that area. This original piece from Radley Balco actually has link after link after link after link to, to get into this story, to show what we're talking about here and how many times it's actually been disputed, but never within the confines of a courtroom. 
There's also a little bit of good news follow-up to this. The Virginia House passed a bill to pay Keith Harward a million and a half dollars, and they're going to train him and hopefully get him work, and hopefully he'll use that money and training to do exactly what he said and call this out all over the place. Well, that is episode 299 of New World Next Week. James, you were a week early with the tie, man. We should dress up for number 300 next week. (laughs) We'll have to coordinate better. Okay. Well, (laughs) I want to thank everybody for all their well wishes for last week and for, of course, continuing to support our independent, non-commercial alternative media via patreon.com slash media monarchy or slash Corbett Report or any other way that people are able to. James? Thanks once again for three great stories. Thanks, buddy.